Welcome to the Chatter Files. I'm Jamie Young, and um, and today I'm with Patrick Nielsen, who is the trustee for this town of Still, the village of Stillwater, and is also the Democratic, um, the Democrat running for the 43rd state senate seat, currently held by Daphne Jordan. And he is also a member of the New York Democratic Party. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Um, first of all, and this plays into um, everything, um, you attended Rensselaer Polytechnic and um, obtained a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and biophysics. Yeah, correct. <laughs> it's uh, kind of uh, one of these things. Um, <laughs> it's it, it, it. Trust me, it sounds more impressive than it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or at least a degree. Mm -hmm. um, but you also went to uh, School of Law at St. John's University, mm -hmm. and. From there, you um, worked as a public interest fellow for New York State Unified Court System. Yep. So that was well, while I was in law school. And by the way, I um, my law school career was doomed when about, I want to say, three or four months into uh, my legal studies, I started Googling famous law school dropouts. Oh. Um, <laughs> And I happened to find on that list uh, Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, who was one of my all-time favorite presidents, um, and uh, honestly Benjamin Cardozo, who had written cases that we read. That was like a technicality. He he graduated, or he graduated the year after they made law school three years instead of two years. So while he mm -hmm. technically didn't graduate, he did go, but. I saw two people that I admired on that list and was starting to feel like maybe that wasn't the ideal situation for me, especially at $70,000 a year yeah. uh, that I was borrowing. But it was really, in what I got, I think was really important. I think it, it taught me a lot. I did learn a lot. It helped prepare me for the work that I'm doing now. But mm -hmm. it turns out I was more interested in the making of laws in that process than necessarily the practice of law as a lawyer, yeah. it's the uh, the policy side that really interests me. But understanding how the law is interpreted, how the courts get involved, how legislation is drafted, uh, was a really important skill set. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I don't regret it. I mean, I think when I pay my student loans, sometimes I regret it. But yeah. um, you know, it, it's it, it has helped shape me. And given where I am right now, it's hard to say that uh, I would have gone back and done it any differently. Yeah. Yeah, but um, also you were co-founder of two nanobiotech companies. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, are they still in existence? One is a company called Ligandal. They operate out of San Francisco. Um, well, most when I was there was working on basically little delivery vehicles uh, for gene therapy systems. Um, and basically, mm -hmm. currently they use viruses. Uh, viruses have a number of drawbacks, a big one being that if you're using it as a basis for a therapy, your body is trained to fight viruses. So yeah. you have the problem of a patient becoming immune to the therapy that you're trying to give. So these would um, be able to deal with that uh, and actually right now I, I saw an article they're working on um, a novel uh, coronavirus uh, vaccine. Um, so I keep up with them every once in a while, chat every couple of years. I'm still a shareholder. Um, yeah. But I, I haven't been actively involved in, God, six years now. But right. they are looking at a, a novel solution to, to the coronavirus situation. I'm not sure how well it's going to pan out, um, but it is interesting, something that would um, – both help the body generate immunity, immunity to the virus, but also um, 
basically plug up the receptor that the virus uses to get into the cell. He, mm -hmm. it, um, my buddy Andre, who, who is in charge over there, had some uh, simulation studies that showed it to be somewhat effective. Uh, how well that translates, I can't speak to, um, but I'm excited to see the, the creative solutions that they're putting together over there. And you know, I hope they're successful. Yeah, um, some uh, health um, people that have been on the major net news networks have uh, talked about that. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sanjay Gupta, amongst others. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what did you take from that overall experience? Um, being part of a startup company, um, mm -hmm. the whole biotech industry and um, also learning how to practice law. Uh, what was the last part? Why didn't I practice law? Well, how when you were taking classes for mm -hmm. um, to be um, a lawyer, Honestly, I think I probably got burned out on the whole class schedule thing anyway. So I didn't take any time off between high school and college. I also didn't take any time off between graduating from college and going into law school. So that had meant that from kindergarten, when I was five years old, to my first year of law school when I was 23 years old, so what's that 18 years of my life straight yeah. I had been held down to a class schedule and you know honestly I think I got to the point where it felt like I wasn't ever doing anything I wasn't contributing anything I didn't ha I wasn't having an impact you know I would read about stuff and I would write something but it was always practice it was always the only thing that mattered was the judgment of someone who was grading the paper there was nothing that I was doing that had an impact in making anybody else's life better or felt like I was doing anything uh, to improve things. The only time I had that is actually I did clinic work on consumer credit and I got to practice in Queens Civil Court over the summer and we actually had clients coming in with problems. I was able to look at their cases. I was able to negotiate with the credit card companies or the student loan companies or the uh, medical bill collectors and help these people come up with a plan that they could pay or mm -hmm. if there was a problem and sometimes there were, I mean, you've got some of these debt buyers that will fake service. So you get sued and you never find out about it. And then they just start collecting money out of your bank account. And you never had any idea that you owed money to these people. Sometimes they have the wrong person. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a case of identity theft. And I was able to help folks in those situations that didn't have the means to do it themselves. Um, and that felt just so empowering. Right. Um, and I, I felt very alive doing that. I felt, you know, and then when it, with the prospect of leaving that and going back to a class schedule, like I, I wanted to continue having an impact. So I left, I, I went into the startup thing. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my friend had come up with this research um, that we thought was exciting. Um, you know, I felt I knew enough the legal system to be dangerous is probably the truth of it. Um, <laughs> But I was able to help, you know, the company get set up, file founding documents. I'm not sure if I did the best job in the world, but I did a, a good enough job that the company still exists and it wasn't something so bad that someone who was a professional couldn't clean up any of the messes that I made, which was my goal, right? It was yeah. just like, make sure that it works. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the perfect plane. It just needs to fly. Right. right. Um, and, and, I, and I felt like I did that and I learned a lot along the way. I mean... I learned a lot about the industry and how investors view things, which leads into the pieces of healthcare policy for New York that I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some really creative things we can do to um, not only reduce prescription drug costs, but also use the fact that we would be, um, you know, under my, under the proposal that I support, we would be buying pharmaceutical products for 20 million New Yorkers. That's a lot of purchasing power. Right. And so we could say to companies, hey, not only is this what we want to pay for the products you have, these are the products we'd like to see you develop. And mm -hmm. this is what we're willing to pay for them. So that you can say, listen, th there's enough Lipitor's and Lipitor copies 
on the market. We know it's a big drug, mug, uh, money maker for you, but that's not what we're interested in purchasing. But if you have something on Alzheimer's, if you have something on sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. um, you know, areas where there's not treatment, we're willing to pay for that development because that's something that our, our patients, New Yorkers need. Um, Texas actually does this with textbooks. That's why there's a lot of like right wing stuff in our children's textbooks because they're a mm -hmm. huge purchaser. They have a lot of leverage with like the McGraw Hills of the world. Um, so you know, I learned like that side of things, but also like, um, and, I, and I told the story like when I was in New Hampshire when I was working for Bernie, um, we got to California. We must have been there. I think this was like December of 2013. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we had just, we had raised like $40,000 from an angel investor that was a friend of a friend and, um, you know, we're like, go West and, you know, seek fame and fortune and all that kind of stuff. And we're sitting in our, in our house where we were both working and living in kind of a dorm situation. And I'm playing chess with a friend of mine who's on the company, one of the four founders. And, uh, he goes to make a move and falls on the floor in a grand mal seizure. Oh, man. So eyes roll back in the head. He's on the ground convulsing. I'm like, I get him on his side. And I'm sitting there running through this uniquely American calculation where my friend's in trouble and I'm thinking about money. How much is the ambulance ride going to cost? What's the emergency room care going to be? Because we hadn't, 23 year old young men, we thought we were indestructible. Um, we hadn't transferred our insurance to California. Nobody had insurance with a, with a network that included like California hospitals. And of course, when you call 911, you get what you get and they take you where they take you in network, out of network. You don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I'm going through this calculation. My friend is suffering. I'm thinking about money and I'm like going, well, what's the likelihood he's going to be okay? Is he going to pull out of it? Maybe it's not that big a deal. Um, whatever. And eventually screw it. I dial the phone. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, we'll figure it out. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm like cursing myself inside for having thought about this. Uh, the ambulance comes. We're, we're in the hospital, in the ER, five minutes before uh, Edwin, my friend, is fully lucid. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm telling this story. Um, mm -hmm. But I uh, probably shouldn't use his name. But anyway, fully lucid. And they deal with the medication and all that kind of stuff. And we're talking like $5,000 uh, for that. And just recognizing that this is the reason, this is the reason why people, if they have decent insurance in their jobs, but have a vision for something, something they want to build for themselves, a bakery, a restaurant, a new service, a new product. It keeps people in that position, play it safe. Don't risk anything. Because if you lose your health care in the situation, I mean, we got lucky. It wasn't anything serious. Didn't hit his head. Perfectly healthy, successful human being today. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the fear of that. And I talked to folks in the Valley that were working. And, you know, and the, one of the nice things about Silicon Valley is everybody's working on something. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody's got a dream. It's like, you know, what LA has for actors and actresses Silicon Valley has for entrepreneurs trying to like, everybody's got a vision for this new thing and it's, it's an exciting place, but some folks are like, listen, I got a, I got a good healthcare plan. You know, I, I got a family. I, I can't, I can't do this right now. Maybe, you know, and, and it's that thing that you say over and over to yourself, maybe next year, maybe in two years, well, three years from now, it'll be a better situation. I'll have the money saved up and I'll be able to do that. And then the time period where your idea would have been successful. Now somebody else has gone and done it or the market situation has changed to the point where it wouldn't be successful and how much creativity and innovation is being stifled in America, which is supposed to be the land of take a risk, make your thing, build something new. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a healthcare system that says, stay where you are, play it safe. You might get sick. And by the way, if you do, it's the most expensive care in the world. Mm -hmm. So these two things are completely at odds. And, you know, I think one of the best things we can do for the economy in New York, people want to talk about attracting businesses, creating jobs. Let's have a healthcare system that guarantees everybody healthcare is a right. Make sure that a small business isn't pinching pennies or trying to provide healthcare to new employees so they can competitively hire people. It means that if you're in that job, you've been in for 20 years, but you're worried about losing your plan, don't worry about it anymore. 
Try that thing. Open the bakery. O open the open the restaurant. You know, l leave the law firm and go into solo practice because you've got an idea. Whatever it is, take a shot. Right. Because when people take a shot, sure, nine out of ten fail, but one out of ten succeed. And when those one out of ten succeed, we all succeed. Mm -hmm. It's a new business. It's a new service. It's a new brand. It's I don't know cookies we've never had before. I don't know what people are going to come up with. Yeah. That's kind of the fun part. Is I, I get excited to think about what the possibilities are that mm -hmm. when you kind of set people free and give them the opportunity to pursue what it is they want, we're all going to wind up better off. I don't know what the opportunities are. I just want to put people in a place to make it happen. Right. right. So um, that was a long winded story, but it was a great question. Hey, hey, really I don't mind. It. I don't mind. Um, but um, now moving more into the politics. Um, in 2014, you were an intern for Aaron Wolf's congressional campaign. Mm -hmm. um, then after that, 2015, 2016, you were working for Sanders on his presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. um, same year, 2016, you worked for Mike Derrick. Yep. And then you went back and worked with um, Bernie Sanders just this recent. But also I found that um, you also try to bid for Congress yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Every, yeah. <laughs> I, I still have people like I was on the Bernie campaign and it would bug me because, you know, I'm a village trustee. I'm a member of the New York State Democratic Committee um, and I've gotten things done in those capacities. But people still like to refer to me as like, here's my friend Patrick. He ran for Congress once. It's like, thank you for introducing me by the, the race that I lost. <laughs> Can you pick one of the ones that I've won and introduce me by that? You know, you know, I, I'd rather, you know. So, yeah, I came back for the sequel. As it yeah. were, um, you know, I was uh, I was also a delegate in 2016. I'm a delegate again this year, though. I don't get to go to Milwaukee like I did to Pennsylvania. I'm going to be I'm going to be going to the Democratic National Convention sitting right here. Yeah. Um, virtual. Yep. But hey, it's still an honor to be selected um, mm -hmm. and to get the votes from people. But anyway, yeah, I you know, it was it was the. I remember I think I remember in 20, 2009, 2010. Um, I wish I had a better inspiration story because it's like not great, but I was watching real time with Bill Maher, Neil deGrasse Tyson is on, goes on this huge rant about we need scientists in Congress. You know, it's all businessmen and lawyers. And I go, oh, you know what? Maybe that's something I can do. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what set me on the path that leads me to your show today um, was I was going to take the scientific training that I had and try to bring it into the political sphere. And I think, you know, on issues of the environment, it's incredibly important, but considering we have a global pandemic mm -hmm. um, and folks that still don't want to wear masks or th think it's a hoax or uh, any of these other, like, you know, like somehow the world faked the global virus just to get Trump because yeah, the Australian economy and South Korea and New Zealand were responding to it because they wanted to get rid of the U S president. Okay. I mean, People are going to think what they're going to think, but no, this is serious stuff and we need folks in office that take it seriously and that understand, like, and it, it, it's also this thing that we deal with that, like, every time, sometimes things change, right? We, we're dealing with a virus that never existed before, like, December. Mm -hmm. So information comes out month to month, new studies get tried, new information gets tried, maybe hydroxychloroquine will work. Okay, we checked it out. Now, I guess it doesn't work. Okay. You know, it, it's, it, there's... Oh, and you get people that try to poke holes at it and say, well, they said this, and then they said that. They said, don't wear a mask, and they said, wear a mask. It's like, sometimes you get better information, and you use the best information that you have in front of you, and you understand that you're dealing with uncertainty, but you try to go with your best options that have the best chance of working, given the uncertain environment. And I think that's, when, you, when you've practiced science, when you've done studies, when you've tried to make things happen in a lab, like you start to understand the the complexity that you're dealing with and that just because something doesn't work exactly the same, whereas just because you're not a hundred percent certain about everything doesn't mean you don't know certain things um, and respecting the process. Um, 
and also being the kind of person like there's not a lot of folks in the state legislature with a hard science background. So actually being able to read studies like, like I don't need to have something processed for me. If somebody did a study on on COVID-19, I can read the actual paper publication from the uh, from the university that did it or from the lab, look at the data and look at the instruments that they used and be able to make a somewhat objective or informed analysis. Um, obviously, I'm not a PhD and I haven't been in a lab in a lot of years. Um, but working with folks, I think, would give me an advantage um, and to bring that voice to the table and, and deal with these kind of things. But yeah, I, um, I ran for Congress. I was uh, one of the inaugural Justice Democrats. So pri prior to uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez becoming Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, nobody knew anything about the Justice Democrats. And that was when I was a Justice Democrat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. we, um, you know, a lot of us ran. Some of us won. Mm -hmm. And now some many more of us are winning, you know, folks like uh, soon to be Congressman Jamal Bowman, for example, mm -hmm. um, who came out of that same organization. So I always feel a kinship right, um, with those folks. And obviously, you know, I was one of the uh, less successful people, but, you know, it, it, it was all part of the process. And um, I learned a lot, learned a lot about campaigning, learned a lot about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hopefully four months from now, be able to do a good job for folks in the state Senate, um, which puts me in where I want to be. I just want to be able to contribute, just want to be able to serve, want to be able to give the best that I have to the community that helped raise me and that I came up in and try to solve some of these big issues, like getting folks health care, like getting off of fossil fuels, mm -hmm. like improving our quality of life. So, yeah. All right. Um, go um, ahead. Continue. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fine. That's fine. Um, You brought up the whole thing about um, healthcare and um, the vaccines and all that. Your thoughts, being somebody that studied science and obviously has been following everything about mm -hmm. COVID-19, your thoughts on what was just released from Sputnik, the Russian uh, paper, news outlet uh, about um uh, is this about the russian vaccine right i haven't had a chance to look into it more than just hearing that there's a russian mm -hmm. vaccine yeah. i know um one of my future colleagues uh senator biagi did tweet out she's like i wouldn't take a russian vaccine for 10 million dollars and obviously right. there's some some mistrust there um yeah you know, i think you got to look at the data i think what we ought to do is um you know, I certainly, given the safety and manufacturing standards between the two companies or two countries, I should say, not companies, um, would like to see, I think this is not having seen it, but just understanding that they're not a country that we have necessarily the best relationship with, mm -hmm. nor a, um, a really good reason to believe what they say. Right. You know, they had soldiers in Ukraine and never admitted that they were their soldiers, right? We, we, we've known, you're probably more likely, if you, if you were to bet that the most, most of what Putin's saying are lies, you'd probably win those bets. Right. So it, it, it's, we need to be able to independently evaluate. And I'd like to say, if, if we get the, you know, the, the processes, if we can get the processes, manufacture our own and run our own studies, before we're subjecting the American people to something that we haven't independently confirmed in a peer reviewed um, way that it is safe and is effective. Um, you know, I don't, I, I may be wrong on this. There's a chance I may be wrong on this, but I don't even, I'm not even sure that Russia is in the, um, there's a consortium of countries within you, which you can do clinical trials such that they're, considered like equivalent i'm mm -hmm. not sure if russia is in that organization or not well i i kind of doubt that because um they're starting to manufacture and distribute this vaccine without it going through phase three yeah i mean and there is i mean we have cause for that in in american law as well if there's a, a high emergency or you can do what's called a a, a, a you can release and then also conduct phase three 
currently with the release, mm -hmm. um, certain like uh, breakthrough drug designations or um, what am I trying to say? Orphan drugs, things where like it's past phase two, it's supposed to go through phase three, but obviously if you're in a terminal situation, it kind of comes under that sort of right to try situation. It's mm -hmm. different, but if people are familiar with right to try and it's um, somewhat analogous that you can get like a, um, I'm going to get the technical terminology messed up, but a, um, like a provisional market approval. Right. So that, that's something that could happen. But again, I would like to see um, confirmation studies done in American laboratories um, with an independently manufactured vaccine. So not taking something from Russia and, and, and administering it to American patients, but taking the science and independently producing the vaccine and then potentially uh, uh, going through phase one, two, and three, or maybe an abbreviated phase one. Uh, based upon the quality of the data and based upon what you know their population generates, but I'm incredibly skeptical of anything that comes out. Uh, we know from 2016 that they had a preferred candidate and a, um, a vaccine for the coronavirus at this time would certainly buoy the election chances of the current president, um, and that may also be what's going on. I'm not saying that that's what's going on. I'm just saying I'm incredibly yeah. skeptical. Yeah. It, it to me, it sounds more like Putin playing politics with the American people. Yeah. Because it taking and approving a vaccine takes an inordinate amount of time. And unless you're doing like human challenges, which is something people are considering now, mm -hmm. which is you, you do the trial where not only are you administering the vaccine, you administer the vaccine and then you purposefully expose the patients. Now, this will get your good data in a shorter period of time. However, it is very risky to the population of the people that sign up. So there's some bioethical considerations mm -hmm. uh, and, and a huge element of informed consent. But that is a way to get data rather quickly. I mean, obviously, we can look at antibody levels in the blood. Um, but there's also that, that concern that we've seen, right, where we're seeing the dissipation of antibodies that they're not sticking around for extended period of time. There's problems with reinfection um, and that can cast some doubt on the long-term efficacy uh, of a vaccine. You know, I think social distancing, wearing masks, taking good care of ourselves. New Zealand's been a hundred and some odd days without a single new case. Those things can work to defeat the virus as well. Um, so I don't think that we necessarily, and even if we get a vaccine, we may get a vaccine that's 50% effective. We may get a vaccine that's 60% effective. It's not an excuse to just have a vaccine and then go back to being completely irresponsible. Um, you know, the, the, the long-term ramifications of that are potentially disastrous. You know, I remind folks, um, they go, well, you know, it's only been this many people, like 160,000 Americans uh, have passed, which is, closing in on like the total number of people that passed away be in service in world war ii incredibly tragic mm -hmm. um, but they still want to make comparisons to the flu which in a bad year claims sixty thousand lives in this country which is a and, small percentage yeah but we did all the things we did for covid right mm -hmm. so with, with a normal flu season we don't do social distancing we don't mandate mask wearing we don't do work from home. We don't shut down non-essential businesses and it kills 60,000. We did all of those things for COVID-19 and it still cost 160,000 of our siblings, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our children across this country. And that's with the extraordinary measures that, that we took. Had we not taken those measures, you'd be talking about a million and American yeah. lives. You talk about more than a million American lives. But um, so I think that's a, just an important point to make. There. Yeah. But also another important point to make too is that this was completely mishandled, mismanaged, mm -hmm. and any other president, Republican or Democrat, would have listened to the science, listened to the um, intelligence oh, yeah. and would have moved very quickly very early 
Yeah, and wouldn't have considered, well, how does this going to play for my campaign? Oh, it's going to pass away. It'll be like a miracle. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just, I mean, there is, and, and I noticed this, I did some advocacy um, like in my, in my role as a state party member because uh, as, as the pandemic was ramping up, we had people out knocking on doors getting ballot petitions to get folks like myself on the ballot. It was the same season. Right. Mm-hmm. This was back when we remember the exclusion zone in uh, New Rochelle. Right. And that was around the time the NBA was canceling its season. Well, there was an exclusion zone in New Rochelle, but you had Democratic, Republican and other party candidates and committee members all required to circulate posi- petitions where you hand over a clipboard, you hand over a pen, you're physically present in the exclusion zone. Um, And I did notice, though, even despite that situation, there were some folks I talked to that sort of there's this, there's such a thing as like a hysterical underreaction. Like Mm -hmm. you're coming at them going, this is serious, we have to respond. And they're going, don't overreact, it'll be fine. Like they see people and it looks like people are freaking out. So then some people completely lock down and go, there must be no problem. And so Mm -hmm. it's trying to find a, 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 a rational midpoint, which I think we did all in all fairly well in this state. Right. I mean, obviously uh, we, there's still some stuff to look into as to what happened with, uh, with nursing homes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some of that, I, I listened to some of the hearings, uh, the lack of safe staffing, the, mm-hmm. um, the deaths that happened in nursing homes happened disproportionately in for-profit versus not-for-profit. Um, what am I trying to say? Operations. Mm -hmm. Uh, centers, whatever you want to call them. So there are things to look at, but we, I think we're fairly responsible. Uh, Dr. Fauci said that we were a model for the nation, but yeah, if we had leadership at the federal level, if we had used the um, Defense Production Act earlier on, you know, people want to say, oh, Trump used the Defense Production Act. Yeah, after people were yelling at him for three weeks (laughs) to do it. And those three weeks cost time and lives. Well, actually, he's never truly pulled the trigger on it. Okay. Because if he had pulled the trigger on it, he would have brought um, corporate corporations, you know, the private sector, along with the government sector together and said to the private sector, this is what you're going to do. This is Mm -hmm. how much we're going to pay. Right. Yeah, so it never got to, it was more of a negotiated situation rather than, you know, we think about like FDR having Ford Motor Company, basically, I think it was they produced tanks for the war effort. Like there were a couple of years they didn't produce the Model T. Right. Like, like you think about like, two, it, you know, if we had really gone full bore with the Defense Production Act, to your point, you know, there wouldn't necessarily be a 2021 Ford Fiesta. There'd be the 2021 Ford Ventilator. Right. You know, that, that's, the, the, that's sort of the model for that. So I guess, yeah, you're right. They, I guess he used it more as a bargaining chip right, with the industry rather it. than this is a crisis. I'm taking control. We need to, what you think an authoritarian like this president would be like, wait, I get to use more power? Would right. cling on to that. But in, in this case, you know, when he wants to send thugs to Portland, that's fine. But when he wants to actually like get medical equipment to patients, I guess that's not so fine. So but, even, even when it would serve us for him to be a little bit authoritarian, then he doesn't do it. Yeah. But then Ironic. again, but then again, he's more of an oligarch. Um, yeah. <laughs> more for the money. But um, on the whole thing of healthcare, mm-hmm. um, just looking over at your uh, bullet points, um, writing, you touched on this, uh, comprehensive health care for every New Yorker, which would be preventive care, mental health, addiction, and access to any hospital or provider, um, reducing um, drug prices, um, Reducing the uh, cost for small businesses and uh, entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. and you thought that you were having problems. (laughs) Um, Lower taxes is for uh, local governments. Mm -hmm. Um, What was the other? 
um, protect um, reproductive rights in the state. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how you have worked this out and mm -hmm. would this be possible? Oh, I mean, sure. It's uh, the first thing you have to look at in terms of possibility is that there's 20 plus examples of how this works all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, I, I've used this before, this isn't the moon landing. You know, this isn't a situation where we're boldly going into untested and uncharted territory. We are timidly going into thoroughly charted territory. You know, you think like Robert Frost, I choose the path less traveled by. No, no, we're choosing that well-beaten, worn down path with very little vegetation growing up on it. Um, you know, and it's to a certain extent, it's a privileged position to be in. Granted, you know, not so privileged when you think that 68,000 Americans die needlessly under our current healthcare system, thousands of those being New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, this is, I mean, you go back to Tommy Douglas in Saskatchewan and the foundations of Medicare in Canada or uh, the National Health Service, um, which came out, uh, I think, even under Winston Churchill um, mm. was involved in that process. Resistantly, but involved in that process or in Australia or in France. Um, and we know that we're spending next to twice as much as any other country is on their healthcare system. So to think that we could save considerable money, um, absolutely it's possible. And we're not exactly leading the world in healthcare outcomes. So it's not like we're getting, for the, for the additional money that we're spending, it's not like we're getting more healthcare or a better healthcare system. In some cases, we're getting less quality at increased cost, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. We want better quality at reduced costs. So... You know, we pay the highest prices for the world in prescription drugs. So there's obviously some room to negotiate that down and get savings for folks. Um, and there's just, I mean, it, there's a million ways to attack this. And it's hard to be simple when you're dealing with like a sixth of the economy. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of inter, interconnected pieces. Um, but we just think about bureaucracy, right? Twenty, I think it's 20% of the healthcare system is in the billing and then the paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I've talked to healthcare providers that go, you know, Pat, I'm a billing department that happens to practice medicine. They're spending more resources on dealing with multiple different payers who bill on different forms and pay out on different schedules. Uh, if you simplify all that, you make the system that much more efficient by having a payer. Who do mm -hmm. you bill to? New York Health. When do they bill out? The same time New York Health always bills out. What's the form? It's one form. So it, it frees up our healthcare providers to focus on practicing medicine. Um, you know, it, it's always when you're trying to order a test, which payer is going to allocate that? When do you need prior authorization? When don't you need prior authorization? So instead of six or seven different sets of rules, it's one set of rules. Mm -hmm. You know, doctors went to med school to be doctors. Nurses went to be nurses. None of them went to law school to be lawyers. Right. Yeah, we're kind of asking that of them to process this legalistic, very bureaucratic system. So that's a situation in which you can get a lot of savings without changing the allocation of healthcare. You're just making it easier to practice and easier to pay. Um, there's the prospect of, you know, we have high deductible and high copayment plans. I know about you, but I don't like going to the doctor. It's not one of the things I sign up to do. I don't like going to the dentist. It usually takes some loved one in my life giving me hell for a while for me to actually make an appointment or in some cases picking up the phone and being like, I made you an appointment on Thursday. Right. You're going. We've had this conversation with our loved ones, right? No, mm -hmm. you should get that thing checked out. You've had pain in that hand for three weeks now. You need to go get it looked at or, or, or whatever it is. We've all had that circumstance. So it's mm -hmm. hard enough. It's hard enough. Right. You get folks to want to go to the doctor. But now when you add $10,000 of a deductible on it, not only do I not want to go because it's unpleasant, but also it's going to cost me a substantial amount of money. So like, why don't I wait another week to see if it goes away by itself? And what we know is 
that means that something that may have been caught early, that means if you got that test, you know, n- n- nobody likes to go in for a colonoscopy, but if you get that every few years when you're supposed to, you don't get colon cancer. Um, I said it because I have it in my family, right? So that's, it's, it's in my, uh, it's in my healthcare. Right. Um, um, it's unpleasant, but it's better than the alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think, so if we get folks into preventative care, we get folks to make sure that we're paying for the testing because they have health care. Not only is it easier to treat things when they're caught early, it's also substantially cheaper right. to treat things when they're caught early. So not only are you providing better health care, you're, you're moving this barrier to going to see the doctor saying, you know, hey, Pat, you don't have a financial excuse not to get that checked out. The only right. reason you're not going is because you're a pain in the butt. Right. So, get, right. so go get the pain in your butt checked out. Yeah. Um, Though there are going to be those that would say that it's Medicaid for all, that socialized mes- medicine, that, you know, there will be, and I've heard this from several people in the past, that it would be like Canada's health care. And they say, that, oh, I've known people that have been waiting for this or, in, or this procedure for years. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's important to remember that in terms of international health care standards, we're number 37 in the world and Canada is 30th. So being handed this health care system is a step up mm-hmm. in terms of quality. Uh, yes, there, there are. We want to talk about wait times. Again, 68,000 Americans die every year because they get no health care at all. Mm-hmm. So you want to talk about wait times. It's talking about waiting until you're no longer trying to see the doctor and instead you're seeing the coroner. That's an insane wait time. So and every health care system has some form of rationing involved. We just have the worst form of rationing, which is to say, if you can't afford it, you don't get it. Uh, and that's not not a good system. It's not a humane system. It's also not an economical system because we're paying twice. Like our rationing system is so bad that it doesn't actually reduce cost. Mm-hmm. Like all we're doing is taking care away from people, but we're not even, at least Canada with their system gets some financial savings from what they're doing. And mind you, it's for elective procedures. You know, I, um, you know if, if you're, think about hip replacements, for example. If you have a wear and tear situation where you're doing it to improve your quality of life, there's going to be some wait time. There's wait time in the United States for that procedure. You're not getting in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if you fall off a ladder and fracture your hip in Canada and the United States, you're getting your hip replaced tomorrow morning because that's what needs to be done. So it's not for emergency operations. It's not like people are waiting in lines for necessary procedures. It's elective procedures. Uh, and mind you, Canadians like their healthcare system a lot more than Americans do. And the wait time problem in Canada is more of a Canadian problem than a problem with single payer systems writ large. Australia, I think it's in the top 10 healthcare systems in the entire world. They have a similar system, um, but they don't have the same kind of waiting time issues that Canada does. So it's not necessarily an indictment of the entire uh, system. Um, but there's a lot of things. I mean, Canadian healthcare is good healthcare. Um, so anyway, that, that's the, there's, yeah. and as far as like socialized medicine goes, it's not, it's single payer. That's different. I know that's a technical distinction, right? It's, it's uh, socialized medicine would be VA for all and not Medicare for all. Um, mm-hmm. but frankly, you know, now we're talking about ideologies and people are going to have different ideologies. Show me the numbers. Like it, it's this, the status quo is untenable. The status quo is the reason why we have one of the worst responses to this um, pandemic than any other country in the world, right? There's no, it's not a coincidence that all the other countries that have a universal healthcare system are dealing with this pandemic better than we are and we don't have one. Those those, those things are related. Right, Um, right. Um, But people that want to put their ideology ahead of good policy, like, I don't like it because the government's involved. I don't have time for that. Okay. It's sometimes you have the government involved because that's what works. And sometimes you shouldn't have the government involved because the government's not good at that thing. Healthcare is a situation where um, as a publicized system, it's just, it's just better overall. The, the, the market does not have 
the capacity to adequately provision healthcare. And I could go into the economics of that, um, but the simplest way to illustrate that is, uh, would you take a free open heart surgery tomorrow if I offered you it? Oh, it depends on if I needed it. That's the point. If I offered you a free car tomorrow, you'd take it. And, 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 and it, it depends upon what it is. <laughs> But you can sell, you get my point. Yeah. For free, for a free, a, a proper consumer product in the market, if I was to lower the price to zero, people would take it. Mm -hmm. If I make quadruple bypasses free tomorrow, there's not going to be any more quadruple bypasses than would have happened at the current price. It's not cost dependent, which means in a market system, prices are only ever going to go up because there's nobody who needs, not nobody, but very few people who need a medical procedure that are gonna go, you know what? I'd rather just die. Right. It's too, it, that's too much money. I'm going to take the out and I'm just gonna go in the box. Right. Just put me in the ground. I don't wanna be here anymore. Not at that, you know, I'm not buying at that price. No, people go, I'm gonna die. What's it gonna cost? Okay, I'll, I'll go on GoFundMe. I'll figure out a way to raise Whatever it. Whatever it takes. <laughs> right, so that's not a situation where the consumer is anyway empowered to get a better price because the only way you lower the price on that car you're trying to purchase is by telling the salesman, I'm gonna walk away. Mm -hmm. You know what, I don't need it. You don't have that capacity in a healthcare system. So that's the reason fundamentally at the bedrock level, a free market healthcare system is a, um, it's an oxymoron. It's a, it's a contradiction in terms, it cannot, fundamentally function and that's why no uh, no industrialized country in the world has the kind of system that the republican party thinks we should have in the united states they want to run the largest um health system experiment on the american people trying something that's never been shown to work anytime it's ever been tried i'm just saying hey we're number 37 we have 36 things to learn from let's mm -hmm. try some of those before we go off with some cockamamie scheme that nobody's ever made work. I'm being the conservative. Yeah. Let, let's try what we know works. Yeah, and Trump is continuing to whittle away at the ACA. Yeah. Go figure. So, uh, but that um, is one of, that, that's one of the points too, and I, I have to make this with folks, is when you're, crafting something like this you want something that's durable from a policy standpoint right there's a reason why social security has stood the test of time because everybody pays into it and everybody benefits from it same thing for medicare you know the republican party conservatives fought like hell to prevent social security from happening but they didn't get back into office until they promised to protect it they fought like hell to stop Medicare from happening. But even our Congresswoman, the radical right winger Trump supporter says into the camera, I will work diligently to protect social security and Medicare. They become bedrock programs because everybody pays in and everybody benefits. That makes them durable. That means we don't have to hope that we always have the best elected officials for these systems to work because people go, oh, you're screwing with Medicare? Uh-uh, I'm not having it. The phone goes off the hook, the letters come in, don't do it. Um, that's why a Medicare for all system is more stable and durable because we don't need to have a necessarily the most progressive or the best government at a time for that program to withstand attacks because it's not fixing this little thing over here and fixing that little thing over there so people don't notice it. It's something that everybody's bought into. Um, and I think that those are the models for successful policy. The government is best when it does things simply and it does things that just broadly benefit everybody. Government doesn't work really well when it tries to throw darts and fix this little thing over here and fix that little thing over there and pretend like they can understand all the ramifications of the decisions. You know, it's, I'm a village trustee. People didn't have water. We built a public water system. People have water. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We provide people with water directly. You know, it, it's not, it's not, well, the water company was doing this, this, and this. So we ran this one pipe over here. We ran that. No, and everybody buys in and everybody benefits. 
Um, which by the way is my argument for why uh, government can work because when you turn on your faucet, when you flush your toilet, that's government at work. And most of the time it works. <laughs> it works so well. We don't think about it. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, let's move on to the environment. Cool. Um, just like down there in uh, Stillwater, folks up here in Plattsburgh and Clinton County are very much within the rural area. Um, nice view of uh, Adirondacks, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, you want to uh, have New York move to 100% renewable energy along with um, removing, I would have to say, um, funds for fossil fuel development, mm -hmm. um, support uh, green new energies like solar, wind, and hydro, and um, also on some uh, biofuels. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's... It's just, it's just got to be done. I mean, it's, I, it, we're at the pull an all nighter portion of dealing with climate change. We have elapsed the opportunity to do this slowly in a measured way over a long period of time. We have deadlines, mm -hmm. um, and a hundred percent or being a hundred percent carbon free or carbon neutral. By 2050 is the latest deadline that international panel uh, or intergovernmental panel on climate change has set for us. And regardless of what Fox News will tell you, usually when the IPCC sets a deadline, they're very conservative about it. And oftentimes things move faster than they predict, which is why there's this push on, well, let's look at 2030 or 2035. That's why I'm supportive. You know, I was encouraged by uh, Vice President Biden's plan. Uh, that set the benchmark at 2035, which was also the mark that I ran on when I ran for Congress. Not that mm -hmm. I'm taking credit for what he did, but I think that's a smart place to be because it gives us some cushion against what the IPCC is saying. But also, if you've ever done anything with governments, um, governments notoriously bad at keeping on deadlines. We set deadlines for projects and then we don't, we don't keep them. Um, so building in some wiggle room, that gives us a chance to say, hey, if we're five years late, we're still 10 years early. Mm -hmm. um, I think is, is ultimately wise um, when you understand the imperfections of the system in which we have. So yeah, it, it's, we have grid modernization that we have to do. There's a lot of like support structures that have to be done to make renewable energy uh, feasible as the bulk provider of, of electricity. Um, the good news is, is that's a lot of work and a lot of work means a lot of jobs. Right. You know, this, is, this, is, this is good paying union jobs that folks are going to be able to build a career on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also moving us in a direction of economic growth of, uh, uh, and, and sustainable communities because like we want to be able to, to breathe the air and drink the water and protect the, the environment that we have. It's not super stable. You know, I, I think about the long arc. Human beings evolved during one of the most mild and stable periods of climate that this planet has ever seen. We ain't been here but a minute, 100,000 years, barely mm. been here. Oh, yeah. And, and since we've been here, it's been peachy, and we're rapidly undoing that. And I don't know if you've checked this out. We're not the hardiest of species. No, we're not. We're, 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 we're not the most survivable. So we really kind of need to keep things within a margin. It's not necessarily saying like the planet's you know, what is it uh, George Carlin used to say? It's, you know, people say, save the planet, save the planet. The planet's not going anywhere. We are. Right. So it, it's more about preserving an environment in which we can live and where people aren't having mass migrations. If we don't, we talked about flattening the curve, flattening the curve. There's a climate change curve. And if we don't flatten that one, what we've been through in the last eight months is going to be child's play compared to what's coming if we don't flatten that broader curve of uh, man-made climate change or human-caused climate change, I should say. You're right. No, right. Though, if we're, though if we're being honest, it was mostly men. 
Yeah, 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 true, true. But um, this brings to really the last one I want to cover here is um, education in our economy, which mm -hmm. going uh, 100% uh, uh, neutral with the um, does play into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you want to, or I can, whatever works. Yeah, well, um, thriving wage, which is always a good thing. Um, oh, to fund the schools more fully, meaning not private education, obviously, but public. Mm -hmm. um, increasing the uh, aid and incentive uh, municipalities, along with um, naturally supporting health uh, reform. But um, developing more um, within the manufacturing area and um, price support for um, farm goods. Mm -hmm. And restoring uh, that uh, 0.25% stock transfer for uh, billionaires, basically. Um, mm -hmm. I can continue to go through these, but uh, I think yeah. you probably have the general idea. Well, I helped write them. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, actually, there's... Uh, there's there's one on there I want to talk about that's less of a a big picture huge thing and more of a small change, but I, I think it's important that we talk about it and it deals with you know kind of the relationship between our businesses uh, and the state. Actually, I'll deal with two. Again, goes back to my time as an entrepreneur and the challenges that that we faced. Mm -hmm. um, so and it has to do with when you're going to hire your first employees. Right. Okay, I'm I'm a small business in New York State, ideally in upstate New York, maybe in Saratoga County, um, and I I'm at the point now where I'm hiring employees. This is a thing that mm -hmm. we want people to do. This right. is this, this is good stuff. So, what we can do is there. The, number one, there's a problem. We have a very bureaucratic system. You're required to purchase workers' compensation insurance, which is a good thing. You're required to purchase uh, disability and paid family leave insurance. And there's a lot of uh, pieces of paper that have to be filled out and signed and filed, uh, which is a nightmare if you're trying to do it yourself. Um, so what can happen is, the problem is, the first notice you get from the state of New York that you forgot a piece of paper somewhere or you didn't purchase some policy oftentimes comes with a $500,000, $1,500 fine. Like, hey, you forgot to do this thing. Please pay us, you know, your worker's salary for two weeks and file it. So I'm of the opinion that people make mistakes. New businesses definitely make mistakes, that you ought to get notice in like 30 days to fix it before anybody gets fined. Mm -hmm. Like something simple like that that just says like, instead of pay us, you screwed up. Hey, we noticed you forgot to do a thing. Right. Like Clippy on the old uh, <laughs> word. <laughs> word. Hi, I've noticed you've liked to hire employees. You've right. forgotten this piece. Do you, do you want to fix it? Yes, I want to do that. Okay, now I have the insurance policy. I've solved that problem and I'm not out any additional money. Uh, now, obviously, if people try to get away with something, 30 days is enough time to solve that. But also what happens um, when you're hiring new employees is oftentimes you don't want to deal with this bureaucratic mess because not only are you filing with the state, you're also filing paperwork with the federal government. So people hire ADP, they hire paychecks, they hire companies that they then pay to administer all this. And that can be $500 a month. It can be more than that. Um, mm -hmm. Considerably more if you're hiring, say, 10 employees or something. Um, and mind you, they're not responsible if they screw up. So let's say you hire a payroll company to do this, and they tell you that they took care of. I, I don't have any experience with this. This isn't a situation that happened to me at all, right? Um, yeah. It is. that I, I ran into this problem. Um, your payroll provider might be like, hey, we took care of that. So you go, okay, you took care of that, great. And then you get a notice from the state four months later saying pay us $500 because you didn't do the thing. 
And then you go to the payroll provider and they tell you, check your contract. We're not responsible for that. So I've thought, what if for small businesses, for new businesses in the state of New York, the Department of Tax and Finance in Albany has all of this information. They're the people that you have to file these forms with anyway, right? So when I contract ADP, they're sending my paperwork to the Department of Tax and Finance. Well, if they have all the information, why can't they do the direct deposit for my employees? It wouldn't cost that much more from the taxpayers, but it would alleviate the compliance burden and it'll alleviate that financial burden for our new and small businesses. And when you consider what people are paying employees, or sorry, paying the payroll providers, that might allow those small businesses to bring on an additional part-time staffer or afford to pay their employees a little bit more at the beginning because we're taking that burden off and that's that money that goes into the local economy. So if we're gonna create the bureaucratic web of hiring people in New York, let's provide the commands for its service to help people navigate it. It's kind of like when we're in local government and the state tells us we have to do a thing and doesn't give us any money for it, we call it an unfunded mandate. Right. All this stuff creates a huge unfunded mandate on our small businesses. Now, Amazon can afford it. They got lawyers and money up the wazoo. But for the bakery, for the, the dry cleaners, mm -hmm. um, for the small businesses that make our communities work, the woodworking store, we got Stillwater Wood here in Stillwater that makes uh, you know custom furniture and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that could be a real burden. So let's make it easier. Just make it easier. Let's, you know... You would fill out the forms with tax and finance. You'd have somebody to help you with it. You'd link your bank account. And then once every two weeks, once a month, whatever it is, the pay period comes, you put in the thing. Uh, Jim worked 23 hours at 1750 an hour mm -hmm. and it processes the payroll. And the taxes, they keep because that's where it was going anywhere. And the mm -hmm. stuff that they have to send to the federal government, New York State can just send a big check once a month to the IRS going, here it is. Mm -hmm. They already do it, right, Jamie? They already do it for the state employees. Right. So that mechanism is all there. Let's just provide access to our businesses. So this is one of the things that I, I, I would like to see get done. I know it sounds small, but I think, you know, coupling that with some other things makes this place a more attractive way to do business and we make it easier for people to, to start up new enterprises. And yeah, we need to fully fund our public schools. I should say that we need $32 million in this district that is owed to us that we don't have. And, you know, given what's going on with COVID and the requirements that are going to be placed on school districts, um, I think it's really important that the state come up with that and the stock transfer tax would help pay for it. That's 13, $15 billion a year that we collect every year and don't use and give back to wall street. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, there's an argument to be made long term about whether we would lose institutions, but over the next two years, when we're in an emergency situation, it's time for the investors to help pay up um, right. so that we can continue to have a functioning state. And this isn't to say, and I should say this, this isn't to say that Washington, D.C. shouldn't do their part. They should. We right. bail out Kentucky and Florida and Texas and Mississippi and probably Georgia every year. New Yorkers mm -hmm. send more money to Washington, D.C. than we get back. We're bailing them out every year. Uh, we're not asking for a bailout. We're simply asking for some of the money that we've been paying to these other states back at a time where we're struggling. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it, we're, we're not asking for something for nothing. We're asking for a little bit back because we've been putting the bill for states that aren't responsible like New York, don't want to pay their own taxes, and don't want to take care of their own infrastructure, take care of their own people, and fund their own schools. So they count on you and me in New York to pay their taxes for them. Well, we'd like some of that money back. Yeah. Yeah, that's what uh, Cuomo has mentioned in the past during some of his uh, briefings. And the controller, too. And, and you know what? I'll, I can say this when it's true. The governor's right about this. I will say it when it's true. I will also mm -hmm. say the opposite when it's true. Mm -hmm. But um, one little tidbit. Um, you're all for the legalization of cannabis. Oh, sure. What's the justification uh, for making it illegal? You, you don't need a reason to make something legal. You need a reason for it to be illegal. And with cannabis, there just isn't one. Yeah. And that's something that I have discussed many times in the past with other people. And 
both Republicans, Democrats, independents, and they all agree. Yep. Make it legal. It can help with deficit. Yep. It's, it'll be a little bit with what we're dealing with, um, but it would be helpful. Though I will say, um, just because, hi, I'm long-winded. Um, I think it's really important that cannabis legalization in the state of New York um, take into account the interests of agricultural communities and farmers upstate and take into account the needs of people to be able to start businesses and be entrepreneurial. The current proposal, at least as I've seen it from the governor, creates a very um, bureaucratic system where basically the licenses are broken up into growing, distributing, and retailing. And nobody can possess all three. So either you're an industrial grower, an industrial distributor, or an industrial retailer. There's no place for someone to just be like, hey, I'm going to try and grow. Let's see if I can breed. And then let's see if there's a market for my product, right? Normally, if you're going to start a business up from the ground up, you're going to produce a small sampling of a product and see if people will buy it. And then if they do, you use the money that they buy it to make more. This doesn't allow for that doesn't allow for that kind of experimentation. You've got to be able to operate at basically an industrial level right from the get-go. And that's going to mean the benefits and those licenses are going to go to people that are either politically connected or already wealthy. I repeat myself. Um, because if you're already wealthy, you're probably politically connected. And we ought to make an opportunity just for small farmers upstate to be able to produce a small amount of product for either personal consumption or for local retailing at a farmer's market or whatever. You mm -hmm. can still have licensing and safety regulations, um, but we don't need heavy, I'm going to sound like a Republican, we don't need heavy handed big government on this industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have safety. It doesn't mean there shouldn't be taxes involved uh, in support of all those things, but let's do it more simply. You know, we, we don't need to create another bureaucratic, you know, regulatory behemoth to deal with this because then we got to pay for it as taxpayers anyway. And that diverts the, the, the revenue that we'd be taking in to the administration, which is one of the problems in New York is we spend a whole lot on government bureaucracy that's not necessarily always on government services. Right, you know, and and I could go into the, to the finer details on that, but um, uh, we've been on for whoa, an hour and fifteen minutes. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. I, I, don't but, worry, I've, I've been keeping track. <laughs> oh, it's all good. I mean, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this, and I'm I need to do more of these. Um, yeah, but, um, this has been fun. Yeah. Uh, well, let's call it a wrap. And thanks for coming on. And um, win or lose, you're more than welcome to be back on. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and good luck with, uh, with, with the cast, such as it is. I've seen some of the episodes and, uh, you know, it's nice to have things, you know, focusing on local issues. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and focusing on the things that are here rather than what the, the large media will tell you this thing over there, that thing over there. And, you know, thank you for your work. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I guess until next time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, have a good one. We're at NelsonforNewYork.com. Check it out. I got to plug the website at least once. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be on the uh, description anyways. <laughs> All right, Jamie, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, have a nice evening. You too.